our teachers' college, the first and biggest school of education in the nation. Here, in a single square block in the heart of New York City, we have invented and reinvented the modern K-12 classroom and the community school. We've launched and reshaped so many fields of inquiry in education, health, psychology, policy, and leadership. And today, we're shaping the future in racial literacy, education in human sexuality, nutrition policy, community health, global mental health, and emotional and psychological resilience. From generation to generation, our faculty, students, and graduates have tackled society's most pressing challenges and improved the lives of the people and communities we've served. Think of us as an incubator and accelerator for creating a better world. So tune in to Teachers College, the premier address for informed conversations about how to create a healthier, better educated, more equitable, and more just world. No matter where you are, you're right in our neighborhood. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Eisner. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at the Columbia School of Journalism, and I welcome you to this evening's program. Last year at Teachers College, I had the extraordinary privilege of uh, moderating a program with Dr. Amra Shabich El Rias, whose story has struck me ever since. Now she has this book uh, that has been published for young adults, but really for everyone. Uh, explaining much more about her experiences and their relevance today. Um, so in just a moment, we will be hearing from Amra. She will read some excerpts from her book and speak more broadly about its import and lessons. Then I'll be able to ask her some questions and then we'll take some questions from you, the audience. So without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome again, Dr. Amra Shabish, El Rias to share her story with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jane. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you, Jane, for um, seeing me again a year later in a very different circumstance and for your kind words and introduction. I am particularly grateful to Columbia University's Teachers College for inviting me to participate in our TC Come Together series. I will begin this evening with a brief lecture, followed by my reading of a section from my memoir, The Cat I Never Named, A True Story of Love, War and Survival, published by, worldwide by Bloomsbury. I will be sharing with you a segment from The Cat I Never Named that I have not read publicly yet. I want to begin by acknowledging that we all, some of us more directly than others, have been affected by the ongoing polarization and social disintegration in the United States of America. Global pandemic by the social unrest around the world. This is a critical moment in our shared history. And many of us are wondering if we can overcome the growing hatred and help our communities heal and come together. The Cat They Never Named, A True Story of Love, War, and Survival has a direct relevance to answering that question. Because my own story mirrors our current sense of uncertainty, fear, violence, and loss of normalcy. But it also inspires resilience and collective empathy. The Cat I Never Named is my true story of surviving the Bosnian genocide. From 1992 to 1995, my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, for short Bosnia, was torn apart. And I spent nearly four years living in my hometown of Bihać, besieged by the Serb army. My family members were slaughtered, friends disappeared, women I knew were dragged to rape camps. I starved, my house was bombed, and we lived without electricity or access to the outside world. On most days, 
I was unable to go to school, which many of us can now relate to either as parents, teachers, or students. For nearly four years, Serbs tried to kill me and everyone I loved simply because we were Bosnian Muslims or Bosniaks. On good days, a friend of a friend was killed. On bad days, someone I loved was blown up. Here, I want to outline the political context in the former Yugoslavia within which the Bosnian genocide transpired. The former Yugoslavia consisted of six republics, or what would be in the American terms equivalent to states, with Serbia being the most dominant state. Slobodan Milosevic, later dubbed the Butcher of Balkans, for his genocide against Bosnian Muslims emerged as Serbia's leader in the late 1980s. Milosevic was a rising dictator who wanted to transform Yugoslavia into an ethnically and racially pure Greater Serbia to solidify Serbia's absolute dominion over the other republics. In 1989, as Milosevic started to openly prep Serbs for the wars he was going to initiate, not just in Bosnia, but also in Croatia and Slovenia, he publicly called for Serbs to unify in battle to protect their Serb identity and white Christian Europe and to create greater Serbia. Fearing Serbia's agenda of ethnic purity and calls to violence, Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia proclaimed independence in early 1990s, but perhaps most importantly in the context of a war, Serbia fully controlled the Yugoslav National Army and responded to each state's proclamation of independence by invading first Slovenia, then Croatia, followed by Bosnia. In 1991, presumably hoping to lessen the bloodshed, the UN instituted arms embargo for all countries born out of the former Yugoslavia, including Bosnia. This strategic misstep proved fatal for many Bosnians because it left us entirely defenseless. In fact, in September of 1992, the current Democratic presidential candidate, Joe Biden, whom I had the pleasure of meeting while he was the vice president of the United States, called on the UN to exempt Bosnian government from the arms embargo so that Bosnian Muslims like me and my family could at least fight for our lives, even if the US and the world wasn't going to intervene to save Bosnian Muslims. But the arms embargo was not lifted. The world did not intervene, at least not then. The genocide against Bosniaks continued uninterrupted until the end of 1995. The cat I never named captures those years of my survival and the intensity of emotions one can only experience in the midst of a war. From a complete exhilaration when I jumped into the river Una to get what I thought was a chocolate bar flowing in the river, to the deepest and darkest moments of depression, triggered by a possibility of being taken into a rape camp for Muslim girls. I am honest as I bring back to life the extraordinary scenes from my life. As you read, you too will see the blood on the pavement and feel the pain that as a teen and a genocide survivor, I struggled through. But you will also find your own resilience as you recognize mine emerge through learning, laughter, and love I had for those around me as we tried to make sense of the world that came crashing down. Genocidal killings of innocent people on the basis of their racial, religious, or ethnic background are never driven by who the victims are, but rather by how they're perceived, portrayed, and othered by their killers. This is where education must play a critical role through the stories we choose to tell and represent in our classrooms. Narratives and stories matter, representations matter, and they matter now more than ever, which is why I chose to handle the tough subjects of hate, discrimination, education, resilience, political and social disintegration of a society, sexual violence, and Islamophobia through storytelling. Milosevic, or the Butcher of Balkans, for instance, brilliantly leveraged Western Islamophobia as he crafted his own narrative to justify killings of the ordinary Muslims. His narrative was powered by imagery of fear and threat of renewed crusades that eventually helped Serb forces morally justify their mass killings of Bosnian Muslims like me. 
Yesterday, a young Bosnian-American dad, Dino Dedic, who shares his first name with my brother, Dino, reached out to me reflecting on those early days of the war and the emotional impact the cat I never named had on him. I asked Dino if I could share some of what he wrote to me with you tonight. So I'm sharing the following with his permission. He was only eight when the war started, but he said, on the first day of war, under heavy bombardment, I vividly remember asking my mom why the Serbs were bombing us. She said, it is because you're Muslim. So I asked my mom, what is Muslim? Because growing up in secular post-communist Yugoslavia, I didn't even know what being a Muslim is. But here I was being killed for it. When you hear comments like Dino's or read the official description of my book as the stunning memoir of a Muslim teen struggling to survive in the midst of the Bosnian genocide and the stray cat who protected her family through it all, your first inclination may be to think of my story as a story of a war that happened to someone else in a distant place, in a different time, that nothing like it could ever happen here in the US. But once you begin reading the cat I never named, you will quickly realize that I was very much like you. I didn't think the war would ever happen in my country in the same way that most of you believe it cannot occur here in the US. I was a math and physics nerd. I loved writing. I played volleyball. I had great friends. And then in an instant, it all changed. The last time I showed up in school before the war started in 1992 as a 10th grader, I learned that all my Serb friends, including my best friend, disappeared. I learned uh, the Serb military informed all Serb civilians to leave so that the Serbian army could besiege mostly Muslims and some Croats and execute us. The Serb military likely expected that it would take only a couple of days, given that we had no weapons to defend ourselves. And here I would like to share with you a map of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where you can see what was called during the war Bihać Pocket or my besieged city of Bihać in the northwestern part of the country where I lived during the war. All around us were the Serb forces that kept us cut off from the rest of the world while killing us. So suddenly, I found myself in a different world, the world that I never imagined before. And how could I? How could any 16-year-old imagine a war in which my best friend's father, a Serb, could be executing me? Or even worse, how could I imagine my own uncle, a Serb who married into my mom's family, as someone who could be killing me? My uncle served as a high-ranking officer in Serbia's military, and I thought that having those close to me imbued into the power structures who could see me simply as a child would protect me. But I was wrong. I underestimated the power of hatred to dehumanize Muslims. Hatred is powerless in solving economic, political, or social problems. But it is always the most potent trigger of violence. Every time the Serb military blew up my family members or classmates, their killing was narrated in the Serb media within the framework of Muslims as a monolithic and violent group that needed to be eradicated from the white Christian Europe. This extermination of Bosnian Muslims was predicated on the narrative of hate that is very similar to that of racism and othering that dominates our public discourse in America today. Data that we have on Islamophobia confirm that most Americans are prejudiced against Muslims, and in Europe, Muslims are often the least desirable neighbors. The anti-Muslim bias is prevalent in media, and Muslims are consistently depicted by violent imagery or as terrorists. This narrative percolates in our daily conversations in our schools, which is why I felt compelled to write The Cat I Never Named as a, sto as a story that could enter our classrooms and fill the void in our curriculum by initiating discussions amongst teens and adults alike. A few years ago, one of my daughters, um, who was at the time in the seventh grade, was talking to her friends about their futures during their lunch in school. And her then best friend said to my daughter, I hope you never marry a Muslim. You know they can be terrorists. Jana responded with, you know my dad. He's the best dad in the world, and he's not a terrorist. 
So today, Islamophobia is an important element to a broader and often accepted narrative of exclusion that has normalized and institutionalized racism against racial, religious, and ethnic minorities in America. And it is this narrative of exclusion that is fueling the emerging white supremacy movement in our country. For instance, the far-right extremists are responsible for over 70% of the extremist deaths in the United States over the last decade. And it is this kind of narrative that changed the trajectory of my entire life. And if we allow it, it will change the future of America, who we are and what we believe in. This is why the cat I never named serves as a reminder that in the U.S. and Europe, the Bosnian War narrative has often been framed as a story of centuries-old hatreds, so the genocide almost seemed as a final step in the evolution of those centuries-old tensions. It made America feel less guilty about doing nothing to prevent the Bosnian genocide. But what the West, which I use here as a conceptual term, has failed to admit to itself, and perhaps deliberately, is that those same ethnic and racial tensions exist here in the U.S. and in Europe. My book reminds us all that capacity to hate is not exclusive to any one group of people, any one region, or any one nation. We all are capable of it. And that is something that we have neglected to recognize in this country. The, inhuma the inhumane killing of George Floyd reminds us of how profoundly we have failed. To give you a visual cue to how far hate can go, I'm wearing this white armband cut from an old Bosnian undershirt. During the Bosnian genocide in the cities that the Serb army entered, like the city of Prijedor, many Muslims were forced to wear white armbands. This mark indicated they were targets to be tortured, killed, or raped. With this white armband, I honor their memory tonight and remind us all how destructive hate, hate can be. And now, the and now the question I want to tackle as I end the lecture portion of this evening is what can we do to prevent this kind of violence and hatred in the United States and elsewhere? There are several tools that are essential to countering hatred, and I will focus on three. One is storytelling that builds collective empathy. Collective empathy, in turn, strengthens social cohesion and we all can agree that social cohesion has been lost in the current narrative of hate. Even many families in America are unable to converse at the dinner table, and we need storytelling to save us, to bring us closer together and build collective empathy. Another essential mechanism to countering hatred is education, your own self-education and education of others, and the storytelling that reflects diverse lived experiences ought to be integral to our educational efforts. Here, I also refer to both formal and informal education. In the midst of a global pandemic, learning is more difficult than we could have imagined only a year ago. But much of my learning during the war was self-education. With no electricity, learning was a challenge, especially in the evenings. I made my own lamp using a tiny glass antibiotic bottle punched a hole in the top, and used a shoelace from my volleyball sneakers as a wick. I burned the fuel that was left in our ancient communist-era bright orange car or whatever non-edible oil or kerosene we could find on the black market. In the morning, I would wake up with my face laced with a layer of black suit. I'm sure my lungs suffered from the toxic fumes I inhaled, but it was worth it for the escape from my horrid reality. By practicing math and physics, I shushed the explosions in the background. So the cat I never named is in many ways a love letter to countering hatred and building a better version of self through education and resilience. I learned to focus then and still focus now on what is internal to me and what I can do. I didn't learn for someone else to love or accept me or stop killing me. I did it for me to simply be better myself, to simply better myself and the lives of those around me. Lastly, love is integral to surviving trauma. The cat I never named, in the cat I never named, I capture different kinds of love. 
The central character in this book is Matsi, or Kitty in Bosnian. She's the cat I never named, who was my unconventional savior in the most difficult moments of the war. The force of good in the world of evil. She was the representation of the normalcy, reminding me that I deserved to be accepted and loved. To learn what happened to Matsi, you'll have to read the book. But I wouldn't be alive today, and there would be no story to tell if it were not for Matsi. And now I would like to turn to reading a section from my book that details the very first moment when the Serbs started to bomb us as we hid in a neighbor's basement because my own family didn't have a basement in our home. Then one bomb falls so close, it seems like it's on top of our heads and the whole house shakes. I feel the feather touch of dust falling from the ceiling. My very bones seem to shake. Everyone jolts awake, calling for their loved ones, screaming, crying, crawling for the lights. But the electricity is out and we're trapped in the dark. My eyes are wide, staring at nothing. I'm certain the world is ending. It doesn't end, not for us anyway, not that morning. The bombing doesn't stop for hours. We are rattled and shaken. But the, that bomb that woke us all is the closest hit. I can still hear them, though, every one. Some bombs are distant, muffled like the footsteps of someone in the night. The closest are like stampeding elephants, like freight trains. Sometimes there's a lull, and we begin to hope it might be over. They've made their point. Tata says, the world is watching, and now the world will stop it. But the bombing continues until noon. Someone has lit candles, and we count the minutes by the loudly ticking clock. By three in the afternoon, it seems like the bombing must be over. Tata and an uncle go upstairs. When they come back, they report that our greatest fear is unrealized. There are no Serb soldiers in the street. Surely that means the United Nations has made them see reason, Tata assures us. We will negotiate. We will rebuild. We will bury the dead, I think. One of the neighbors staying with us bursts into tears when Tata tells her the blast that woke us destroyed her house. But your family is safe, Mama chides her. Things can be replaced. People can't. For a long time, the children remain still with fear. The hours of bombing have subdued us. But we've been locked up for three days. And after a while, even our fear can't keep us still and quiet. We start to beg to be allowed outside, upstairs at least, anything, just to see the sun after our long confinement. I can tell Tata wants Dino and me to stay below. But then he swept up in the work of checking on neighbors, clearing rubble, marshalling supplies, putting out fires. We are on our own. We don't get official permission, but when Tata and Mama aren't paying attention, Dino and I slip outside. We set off hand in hand. I clench him tightly, sure something awful will happen. But soon he breaks free and he's skipping through the debris like it's a holiday. He was afraid during the explosions but he seems like he's already over it. Is he that brave or only that young? He's fascinated by the cross section of the house that was hit. With half the walls sheared off, the private becomes public. A toilet perch perches at the edge of a red precipice in the bisected bathroom, staring at the street. Dino dodges playfully around glass, peers into a crater in the street. I realize that I didn't wear my volleyball shoes. It doesn't matter. After seeing the devastation, I think this is too much for one girl to outrun, no matter what shoes she's wearing. Because it's all luck, isn't it? Good luck for one, bad luck for another. Why was Vesna's house spared while their neighbors was peeled open like a sardine can? I see smoke rising in parts of the city and I imagine people creeping out of their houses thinking how lucky I was. Now watching Dino cavort through the ruined street, I have a sudden reckless feeling. We could all die at any moment. I've been an obedient girl, a good student all my life. 
But this danger would be no different if I were bad. Suddenly, I want to do something bad for once in my life. We're passing the house of Kudich, an old architect with a pretentious French barrette and opinions on everything. The yard is filled with fruit trees and bordered by a limestone wall. The neighborhood kids love to climb the wall, reach over and steal a piece of his fruit. Most of the time it's hard and unripe apples and plums, so bitter and nasty. They call it driskule, or diarrhea fruit. The kids don't care. The fun is in being yelled at and chased by Kudic. Of course, a goody goody like me has never done it. But now, what do I have to lose? I climb the wall, snatch a rock hard green apple, and take a bitter bite of the criminal life. Then I can pretend it's the driskule that makes my stomach queasy as we round the corner to our home street. I exhale a deep sigh. Our street is untouched. To look at our house, you would think there had been no bombs this morning. There are kids on the street, even. I see four girls, all close to my age. One of them, Maida, I grew up with. Her father is a music teacher in Mama's school. Come walk with us, Maida calls out. I have to look for my cat, I call back. But Dino, who I think has a crush on one of the girls, runs to join them. Be careful, I shout. Though, how on earth can he be careful of something dropping from the sky? Then finally, I can do what I've longed to do for three days. I look for Matsi. I call her name, search all around the garden, peer into the canopy of every tree. She's not there. As a last resort, I go inside to look, though I don't know how she would have gotten in. Maybe I left a window open. It is strange being back in my house, even though only three days have passed. It seems so much longer, a lifetime ago. There's still a coffee cup on the table, the remnants dried to black sludge. My cousin Jana's grandmother used to read our fortunes in the coffee grounds. She gave Jana many loves, but me just one. The coffee grounds showed long life for all of us. I peer into Mama's coffee cup, but I have no idea what fate her coffee grounds foretell. I can hear my own breathing echoing in the empty room. The house feels hollow. Matsi. I call, but of course there's no answer. Maybe she's in my room, her favorite place. I run upstairs, but there's no sign of her. Crushed, I walk out onto my balcony and look down the block, where I can just make out several tiny figures at the end of the street, Dina with the four girls. Then an explosion, so much louder than what I heard from the basement. This bomb is like a dragon. I, hear, I see its fiery breath through the window as it explodes at the end of the street. When the smoke clears, there's only fire and wreckage. In the place, Dino and the girls were walking. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Amra. I've read that passage so many times, and just to hear you read it brings tears to, to my eyes. It's It embodies so much of what's happening in your book, the, the magical power of this cat, the bond that you have with your brother, the unpredictability of life during wartime. So please, you must let us know, let the reader know, and the audience what happens next? What happened to your brother? Um, thankfully, my brother survived. Um, and he survived because Matsi was in the back of our property. She was in a separate structure from our house that was our garage. She was in the attic of that garage. And she was, um, what we thought, calling us. She was crying out, uh, but she would not run out to the street. So my brother left um, four of our friends and went to look for Matsi, and he lived. Four of our friends were killed that day. So you decided to write this book for young adults because of all the reasons that you explained, because of the power of storytelling. And 
And yet you were really faced with a, a big challenge, which is how do you portray this kind of horror without frightening off the reader and actually bringing the reader into your story instead of instead of running away frightened how did you manage to um, to do both of those things to be honest to your story and yet to be inviting enough so that young people will read it all um that's an excellent question and i'll tell you that that very um, thinking was what delayed my writing of this book for many years because I worried about uh, staying true to my experience and yet um, scaring off the reader with what I had survived. But a couple of years ago, there was a moment that happened in my personal life that really triggered a sense of urgency to write um, my, uh, my memoir. And um, it was a day when my then third grader um, who loves seahorses and science and is gifted in math as a proud parent i have to mention that uh -huh. came, came home one day and asked me mom what will happen to jana her older sister um and me if you and dad are rounded up as muslims and taken away will we be left alone and that question started many conversations, but also jolted me. It scared me. Here I was, um, a genocide survivor who was very focused on my work in terms of teaching and research, and um, not only at Columbia, but traveling around the world, fixing problems in the field of education. Yet I was neglecting to use a powerful emotional story that could address the issues of discrimination, exclusion, hatred, education, resilience um, that I had uh, in me, that lived in me, was part of my life. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment when I felt that I had to write my story and I had to be honest because teens who survive exclusion and the worst kind of it that I had this survived as a genocide, uh, through genocide in Bosnia, they don't get to choose what they experience. They don't get to choose if they want to be a victim of racism or hatred. Um, and um, they have to deal with those experiences. At the same time, for those who have never experienced exclusion, I think this book in a very emotional and vivid way relates what, so what someone else could be experiencing. Mm -hmm. That way evokes empathy. And um, I am genuine and honest through the book in sharing that there were many happy and beautiful moments as well. And I think that will also be surprising to readers. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that many parents have reached out to me and said, I decided to read a couple of pages before I let my child read it. Um, <clears throat> and then emailed me hours later and said, I couldn't put it down. I just finished your book and I was compelled to write to you. So. Well, I think um, you so beautifully capture that uh, that dynamic, right? Because all of this horror is going around you, and yet you have a crush on a boy, and you're worried about your friendships and the kinds of, if you will, ordinary things that teenagers are worried about, and they sort of coexist with this, you know, uh, sort of broader horror that's occurring to you and your family and and uh, and your community. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, about abandonment. You mentioned it in your talk, um, and and it certainly comes through in the book from the beginning, there was this hope that that the world would pay attention uh, and that this kind of fighting and genocide, would not be allowed. It was this was Europe <laughs> um, within our lifetimes. Uh, it wasn't ancient history, uh, and and yet it didn't happen for a very very long time. How does that affect you as a teenager? It was um, devastating, and um, it certainly triggered a number of moments of of deep disappointment and depression, and almost temptation to respond. Um, to that neglect with hatred. And um, I think that is um, uh, emotion of grievances and abandonment is something that a lot of young people who radicalize around the world feel. Mm -hmm. 
And so the question for me throughout the war was who I wanted to be. I knew that I couldn't control the external forces. I knew I couldn't stop people from killing me. I knew I couldn't um, prevent genocide. In the same way that today we know we can't stop the pandemic and many of us feel we can't stop the social unrest and play the meaningful role to, to end what we're witnessing in our country. Um, but I then realized that there was something that I could always control and that was my own internal self and who I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point for me. That is when I really focused on learning on mm -hmm. self movement. I became, and we talked about this last year in my lecture, I became a teacher. I walked for the first time into the classroom now more than 25 years ago um, into a room full of fifth graders um, and tried to dream with them together and inspire us to believe in better futures so that they could be better people one day. And now thinking back, while I didn't know what was really the purpose of all the learning and self-resilience that I was trying to build at that time, um, I do know what the purpose of that is now. It has turned me into an educator. It, is, it has turned me into someone who wants to speak out on these issues. I am no longer this invisible, silent Muslim girl who was a genocide, um, uh, was living through genocide and could have been one of its uh, victims. Um, but I am an outspoken critic of um, radicalization and I teach on those issues precisely because of the experience that I had um, uh, growing up. And you were able to do this because uh, in addition to all the horror you experienced, you also experienced extraordinary acts of loving kindness and outreach and encouragement. And um, what has struck me, I remember when we spoke about this last year, was that these uh, the, the people who helped you in your journey um, came from many different faiths uh, and and different politics and places. I wonder if you can just briefly share um, what happened and how people saw in you someone who really could become the kind of person you're becoming. Um, uh, that could almost be a subject of a whole <laughs> other book, but... Um, um, there, there were many um, individuals who, who, who helped uh, me become who I am today, namely, and, and first of all, my family. I think that family love that um, I had um, during the war was essential in um, allowing me to, to really survive and build my own self-resilience. I think often we think that resilience means that we're invincible. And in my view, resilience is a process of self-improvement and self-empowerment and self-education that allows one to overcome hardships when they come um, your way. And um, without spoiling the uh, in the book, the section where I talk about how I actually come to the United States, I will share this, that there was a moment when um, I was uh, working on immunizing children in uh, Bihaj Pocket, which I mentioned and we showed on the map that was besieged from all um, sides. On one side, Serbs from um, uh, who occupy the portion of Croatia, and the other side, the Serb mm -hmm. army occupying the rest of Bosnia. And we were in this um, I, complete isolation for years. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the items that we needed for basic healthcare were vaccines. Uh, and we talk a lot about vaccines today. Um, and so UNICEF would send these trucks of vaccines. Um, and I worked with doctors and nurses, local doctors and nurses to organize vaccination. And we would go to some remote areas um, really risk our lives to vaccinate children uh, throughout the war. And um, in that process, I encountered Wayne and Drew, two uh, men who I believe both were child psychologists who were sent by International Rescue Committee to Bihaj Pocket um, to see and evaluate what the circumstances were in terms of the health and mental and, and, and physical health of young children and also what was the status of the schools and how, how much uh, was left of the educational system, if you will, um, as a consequence of the war. 
And at some point, uh, they both asked me um, if I could, um, Drew and Wayne, if I could take them to visit schools. And I did that. And they met one of my teachers who said to them, look, we're all going to die here. Uh, we're not going to survive, but at least save uh, one child, uh, save Amra. At, the, at that point, I was um, uh, I won some math and physics competitions in the country. And so they asked me if I wanted to give them my documents, and I did. I gave them my original birth certificate, my original transcripts, because I thought I was going to die anyway. Um, <laughs> And so they came to New York and um, attended a board meeting um, of the um, International Rescue Committee, which most people at TC are well aware of their work internationally. And there was a board member who stood up and his name um, was David Pincus. He passed away a number of years ago. Um, David stood up and said, is there a life that I can save? And that was the... Uh, that was the moment where my life was saved. Um, and sort of the rest is history. He made sure that I was able to come to the United States and study here. And then once I got here, there were people from all backgrounds, um, racial and religious backgrounds who have helped me um, get where I am today. In just a minute, we'll um, start to ask some questions from the audience, but I'm just sort of wondering what you absorbed from that experience. Of um, of total strangers stepping in, it's as if you saw, oh, I don't know, the worst of humanity and the best of it. How how do you absorb that and and go on? They really resuscitated my belief in humanity, um, mm -hmm. and I will share a detail um, that I often share that I think captures, um, what I had encountered in, in people like David and few others who have helped me. Um, and it's the moment that in fact, I, um, I believe I shared in, in our last conversation a year ago of when I was, um, coming to the United States, um, I was 20 at that point. So I was 16 when the war started, I was 20 by the time it ended. And I was really a broken person. I was terrified. I stood in the immigration line with a broken English, with few dollars in my pocket, and looked at men in uniforms as a threat. I thought men in uniforms meant rape and killing. Um, and when it was my turn to, um, to have an immigration interview, I was holding on to the immigration uh, uh, windows counter because I thought that I would pass out. Um, and I was sure that America didn't want me, that America would reject me, that I was in fact banned from even dreaming of America. And um, the immigration officer took a very long time examining my documentation and my passport. And he reached out, he touched the uh, fingertips of my hand as I was holding onto his counter gave me my documents back, and he said, ma'am, welcome to the United States of America. I'm sorry for what happened to you. You're safe now. And that's really the first moment. Um, um, it's the first moment when I started to believe again that we were part of the shared humanity, and it is a moment that revived me. Um, and I was lucky enough to encounter strangers like that immigration officer whose name I don't know, but who really saved me. Well, you know, that story doesn't just reflect upon him and you. It, it is really serves as an inspiration for all of us about what we can be, what our country can be. Uh, and, um, and I thank you for sharing that. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to be a Muslim now in America. It's difficult. Um, it certainly is difficult. And um, there was a um, initial sense of acceptance that I really found in strangers who've helped me. And I think I was lucky to initially um, surround myself um, with people who were accepting of my uh, background. Um, but obviously, September 11th, the terrorist attack, the tragedy um, uh, changed how we saw um, nearly 2 billion people who are Muslim around the world. And um, suddenly, the public narrative, the political narrative 
um, has created this image of Islam and Muslims as violent, as monolithic. And um, it reminded me again that I had this target on my back, that I had, I was born hated, um, and that I continue to carry. And it is a heavy burden. And obviously in the detail I had shared that triggered my desire to write this book with my daughter being concerned about what will happen to her because of uh, her background and her sister. Um, unfortunately, that narrative clearly is affecting the second generation in, in mm -hmm. my household, and, which is why I feel compelled um, to, um, to take action and to call everyone else who is on this call and beyond this call to action, to do what they can in their communities. We can't stop um, certain external forces, but as I said, each one of us can make a difference in our daily lives in the way that we interact with someone that we encounter who is very different, has a very different background than we do. It seems like there also um, is a, a broader policy message to your um, story, and that is the whole question about um, responsibility, not only in terms of how we treat our strangers and neighbors, but also how countries should treat other countries. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this. You know, there's been such um, an attempt in the last few years uh, to create a, a fortress around America and to worry about our issues alone. And yet your very experience shows um, what happens when the world doesn't care and while it's the most recent experience, well, not even the most recent experience, you see with the Rohingya in, in Bangladesh, you see other groups who are oppressed because of their religion or race or ethnicity. Um, what should the United States do globally? How responsible should we feel? I shared, um, that's that's a question that we could discuss for hours, and there's so many thoughts that I have in, in mm -hmm. reflecting on, on, on what you had just mentioned and asked. But I think the detail that I shared with everyone in the lecture of a decision that, in part, the United States was making along with the United Nations in 1992, when um, Joe Biden, who is now a presidential candidate um, in the United States, called on the arms embargo um, to, um, to end for Bosnia and Herzegovina so that we could defend ourselves. Um, and that decision was not made. And that was in 1992. So we continue to survive through genocide, not only in 1992, in 1993, in 1994, in 1995. And each day people were killed. Each day women were raped because of their Muslim background. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we think about the consequential impact that as the international community we have on uh, people who are often marginalized and, and, and are in countries where they may be at risk of being ex executed and persecuted. Mm -hmm. We do carry responsibility as one of the world's superpowers to set the example, to set the narrative and the level of decency and respect for humanity and human life that I believed America always had within its um, foreign policy framework. Our soft power in terms of the ideas of respect, inclusion, human rights um, were always prominent, um, even if we made mistakes. And I am somebody who is very critical on certain aspects of um, American foreign policy, but we have always tried. And certainly, mm -hmm. as we see with the social unrest in the United States, we do have our own internal problems, and particularly with anti-Black racism. Um, but the narrative that dominates the political um, uh, uh, political uh, political space right now is so profoundly damaging that it is influencing and calling really on violence in places around the world where now violence and executions and persecutions are permissible. Just to give you an example, in the context of Bosnia, um, now there are forces that um, and other foreign powers, including Russia, that are 
um, playing a significant role on the ground in attempting to initiate sort of the second stage or the second phase of ethnic cleansing and genocide. And if that happens in the Balkans, Europe is not safe. And if Europe is not safe, American interests are um, uh, at risk as well. And mm -hmm. so a, a lot more that we could talk about, but I do think that the United States has a responsibility mm -hmm. to be a beacon of hope in the world. So here we are at um, uh, in a program under the auspices of Teachers College. I think we all wish we were actually in that magnificent building. Um, what's the role in education in uh, in all of this? And I realize that's a big question because you've talked about about the idea that um, people do not understand what it means to be a Muslim and how how diverse this uh, it how diverse Muslims are around the world, how Islam is practiced so differently. Um, and, and you've also talked about the need to understand uh, global responsibilities. Where, how do we get down to the nitty gritty of making that part of what we teach children and young adults? That's an excellent question. Um, and I will, share with you a detail that convinced me education is an answer um, from the war. And it was, it stems from, and then we'll get into second part of your question, which is really mm -hmm. um, what we can do and should be doing now. And so the, the mom, there was a moment during the war when a, the Serb army was coming close to my neighborhood and they were burning down a hill right across um, our neighborhood and, and my father and, and I were watching it and there was um, an uncomfortable uh, moment where my father turned to me as a 16 year old, old um, girl and probably said something that no father would ever want to say to their um, daughters. And he said, Amra, we may all be killed and you may be raped. But if you survive, there's one thing that no one can ever take away from you, and that is your education. And that really defines who I am and how I see my role in this world and what I think is relevant to addressing all these issues that we have discussed that are challenging and tough topics. And so I do think that we need to, given what's happening in our country and around the world, in education, we need to step back and ask three basic questions. One is, what are we teaching? What is in our curriculum? That is one the reason why I wrote this book, because stories like mine are not represented in the curriculum. And there are other minority groups and subgroups in our society and beyond around the globe that are not heard, seen, and don't have a voice in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I often say that I grew up in former Yugoslavia without ever reading a story that had the Muslim girl's name in it. I used to search for a math problem being a math nerd um, then and still now. I used to search for a math problem that would have a Muslim child's name in it and never found one. And mm -hmm. so that kind of representation, practical aspects of what it is that we teach and we talk about in the classroom is essential. To give you one example, for instance, with this book and, and uh, Bloomsbury, we have decided to um, collaborate with the Open Book Foundation that has asked me to go into the classroom, um, an American classroom in a school and um, deliver a lecture and, and hold a class that will be built around um, the content in the book. And those kinds of practical um, aspects of intervening in the classroom by diversifying the voices are important. I think how we teach is incredibly important to make sure that we account for diversity of voices and backgrounds and cultural experiences that our students have. Um, and uh, so there are fundamental questions um, of that nature that I think we do need to re-examine more thoroughly to ensure that more diverse and lived experiences are incorporated in, in our content. And that also means diversifying those who have the privilege to teach, who are our teachers, who are our professors, and what do we bring to the table in terms of social justice, in terms of diversity. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, 
This has been another extraordinary time uh, for me personally uh, to converse with you. I do want to encourage everyone to, um, to read this book. I don't think it's just for teenagers. Um, I'm a mom and I really got so much out of it as well. Um, I know that there is more information that we would like to share uh, about some of the reactions to the book. So perhaps we can put that uh, on the screen. Ah, here is a question. Um, someone wants to know if you have been back to Bosnia recently, and if so, what was that experience like for you? Um, I, um, obviously because of pandemic, um, I didn't go back this year, though I was planning to conduct research um, with migrants who are um, coming into Bosnia from um, many countries that are affected by conflict and violence, uh, similar issues that we are discussing tonight uh, from Syria, Pakistan, um, uh, Iraq, who are attempting to enter the EU um, through Bosnia because Bosnians, uh, Bosnian border is very porous. It's along, especially my home city, Bihać, is only five minutes from the border with Croatia. And so there are migrant ca camps where I wanted to travel back and conduct research um, to examine um, their stories and their experiences of being persecuted and why they're in Bosnia and why they're aspiring to enter the EU that doesn't want them and is rejecting them. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to go back um, next year after pandemic is over. And my hope is that it will be over then um, but I go back to Bosnia frequently for work and, and with my own family. Well, thank you. Uh, we have another question. How do you feel about Bosnia diaspora today who supports people who have similar discriminatory, discriminatory practices that Milosevic Jews? What, what do you say to them to combat this ignorance, ask this person. Selma is asking. My simple question there is for Selma and everyone is education, education, education. Um, I think um, exposing people to stories of genocide um, in Bosnia and elsewhere uh, hopefully would serve educational purpose uh, for them to critically think and examine what kinds of narratives they should be supporting today. Oh, well, thank you. We have another question. Uh, when you saw young Muslim boys stealing from a Serb neighbor's house, you wrote, they deserve nothing. Your Tata responds with a humanistic spirit. How important was he in shaping your values? Excellent question, Vic. Um, this is a perfect example where one, um, as a young adult, can experience need to say, well, why should my father intervene? And this is a scene in the book where my father is trying to intervene when he sees a um, um, couple of sort of thugs go in and rob a, a, a house, a Serb home right across our um, home. And um, I'm upset about it. Um, my father is upset about it, but I'm upset because my father really deeply cares that stealing stops even though it is a Serb home and um, that family left before we were besieged. Um, so my father was essential really in terms of guiding me to stay on track. Um, and there's another conversation in the book where my dad and I are debating what the good person is. And um, that was the moment when I realized that the good person is someone who's constantly questioning themselves and their own actions towards others and whether they themselves are um, biased in any way towards mm -hmm. others. And that is what I learned from my father, to always examine yourself, your actions, and see how you can be more inclusive, how you can improve lives of others and not just be focused on your own sort of innate reactions that I had during the war where I was compelled to feel um, hate towards those who were killing me. Um, so he was incredibly influential. It seems that he also just helped you maintain hope in yourself. He did. 
Um, he did. Um, and I think both uh, my father and my mother played an important role um, um, throughout um, my my time uh, during genocide. And, and my mom still lives with with me, uh, with my children, and she has similarly calming and important influence in who my children are. Uh, she's also a retired teacher. Unfortunately, my father didn't um, didn't live long enough to to see where we are today. But I'm sure he would love the way that I portray him and credit him with important influence in my life. Oh, well, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Ah. From Sarah, my 12-year-old daughter, Josephine, read your book and is wondering what message you were trying to convey with the chocolate bar scene in the river. Ah, good question. I remember that scene. Can you explain it a little bit? So it's a moment where we're sort of fighting who is going to get to this chocolate bar because we saw a chocolate bar floating in the river. You have to put this in the context that we were really starving and didn't have food. Then suddenly there's chocolate and we haven't seen chocolate in a very long time. And so there's a struggle in who's going to get to it first. And in the end, the chocolate bar is empty. And I think there, there was just uh, the, the reason why I incorporated some of those moments is to bring a bit of levity to this story so that those who are teens who are reading it can sort of relate to that. We were silly teens and silly kids um, even in, in the midst of the war. Um, and aside from that, I love chocolate and I love <laughs> surviving. Um, I'm going to share this, that after the war ended, uh, one of the first, um, one of the first trips that I, um, describe and I, and I get to, to Croatia, um, before I travel for the United States, one of the first things that I bought and ate was chocolate. And <laughs> wasn't one chocolate bar. Um, <laughs> that's how I spend my first money after surviving <laughs> on eating well, chocolate. That's another reason why your story is so <laughs> universal, Amra, <laughs> because <laughs> we all love chocolate. Oh my, thank you so much. This has been another extraordinary evening. I really want would like to thank Teachers College for making this happen and um, and sharing this moving, stirring, important story. If you haven't read the book, you must uh, and share it widely. And gosh, I just, I am looking forward to having more conversations with you after the pandemic in person. And um, <laughs> I wish you and your family all the best, good health and fulfillment and to continue to teach us all in the way you do. Thank you, Jane. I am grateful to everyone who uh, was with us tonight, and you particularly for having this continued conversation with us. Um, I know that last year we couldn't have imagined we would be where we are today. If someone told us, we would have thought that it is just impossible. And so I am, as an optimist, I am going to imagine that next year, this time, we will be together at Teachers College in a room filled with students and having some kind of more optimistic, I hope, and, and lifting conversation than um, some of the difficult topics that we had uh, touched upon tonight. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you.